My name is Lindsay Pruitt. I'm an engineering manager with a consultancy called Equal Experts. And we've got teams working here in Cape Town, in Joburg, Australia, New York, Portugal, India, Berlin, and in case you're wondering about my accent, uh, the UK, which is where I'm from. Um, you'll be pleased to know I made it out just before they shut the UK down because of um, some virus that's been going around. Um, so I'm, I'm here to share some of the, the lessons that uh, we've learned over the last few years with, with running chaos days on very large platforms. By large, we're talking about uh, platforms that have tens of delivery teams uh, building public-facing services on them and uh, are working with hundreds of microservices. Let's start by understanding what chaos engineering is and why it's important to us as, as engineers. I didn't build Nest in a day, uh, but it's a great example of how using uh, a combination of some, some really cool cloud tech, uh, things like um, what you can get from GCP or AWS serverless type technologies, combining those kind of things with modern development practices like lean and agile, it allows you to build something uh, incredibly sophisticated and very, very distributed very, very quickly. So I can sit on my sofa and not have to reach to the thermostat to, to make my house kind of warmer or cooler. I can just use my smartphone to change the, the heating. And when I'm doing that, uh, I'm just thinking about my smartphone and my thermostat and my heating system. But actually what's happening is that there's um, compute... Um, instances running maybe on the other side of the world that are involved in this process. But I'm an engineer and I know, you know, I, I trust Google a lot and I think they're a great company. So if I'm building stuff on GCP, what could go wrong? You know, it's, it's a rock solid platform, sure, right? I don't know if any of you saw this that happened uh, back in, in June uh, when there was an outage uh, on GCP in the States. Because Nest uh, requires GCP to operate, it meant that people sitting on their sofas you know, who, who can't simply reach, reach up and turn the air conditioning up or down, they were really stuck because Nest wasn't working on their phones because their phones needed to communicate to, to GCP. GCP was down, and so they couldn't change their air conditioning, which is just awful. Because what's probably worse is that um, you know, if, if it's really quite an effort to get a key out of your pocket and put it in the door, it's much easier right, to use your smartphone to unlock your, 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 your house with a smart lock. And Nest provides that kind of technology. So the same outage meant people couldn't get into their houses. This is a great example of how modern software uh, that's running in a kind of very distributed way is often failing. And, and there's failures happening all the time in these kind of systems. What's hard to predict, though, is when certain failures happen in a, in a cert and combine in a certain uh, way that you get a significant uh, impact. The incident report that Google published on this was really interesting and was a great example of, of how uh, why chaos engineering is important. There wasn't just one uh, bug or one failure that caused this outage. It was three separate, unrelated uh, bugs that combined in such a way to take down uh, the GCP network in a significant part of the US. Modern distributed software is always operating on the edge of chaos. It's important that we try and understand the different failure modes that can impact our systems and learn more about them. I want you to have a think about the systems that you work on. So try and think in your head what the different component parts are that you know about. How are each of those different components connected? How reliable is each of those components? Could any of them fail? Are they rock solid? How about the connections between them? Are they rock solid? Could they fail, time out, start having delays? What about components that uh, you haven't built that your, your things depend on? Are they talking to any third party services? The systems that we, we typically de uh, develop today have a massive amount of components and it's very, very hard to, uh, to predict exactly how they're gonna fail. Unless, of course, you're working on a simple system now, hands up if you're working on a system like that. No, okay. Well, so hopefully this talk will be of interest uh, kind of to, to all of you then. But most of us are working on hard systems uh, that have multiple components. We can use chaos engineering by deliberately invoking failures in a controlled way into multiple components and then observing 
how things react. So observing, how do people notice those failures? How do those failures uh, combine and manifest themselves? How, how does our, our telemetry tooling uh, can surface those failures to the different teams? And how do people uh, work out and diagnose what's wrong and how to fix it? Through those observations, we can then reflect um, what have we learned about our system that's going to improve our ability to support it? What kind of improvements have we identified that we can put into our, our processes and also our components to make them more resilient, more robust to failure? To do chaos engineering, you don't need to be running EKS on AWS. You don't need to be using any of the latest kind of cloud tech. It's fundamentally a mindset change. It's very similar to, um, to the kind of the build quality in principle that, that has helped continuous delivery become so successful. By helping everyone involved in the engineering of product to build resilience in from the very, very start, and people start thinking about how failure can manifest itself in the different components and the things that those components depend on from the very start of designing something, it allows to build systems that are much more robust. When we say resilience, uh, we're not talking about systems that are completely infallible or systems that will never, ever go down because failure is a, is a, kind of a, a fact uh, with the systems that we're building. Things are failing all the time. It's just uh, only when certain failures combine do we see significant impact. Instead, we're trying to understand how to uh, build our systems so they're more elastic, so they uh, can bounce back when there's a failure. It make, it, we're trying to figure out how to make our systems so that we can more quickly diagnose a problem and bring normal service back online. I think the English dictionary is probably going to soon change because not many British institutions are remarkably resilient anymore. There's four chaos engineering approaches that I'm going to briefly summarize. Um, the fourth one is, is not a very popular one to talk about, so we'll deal with that later. Manual chaos engineering includes things like chaos days, AWS game days, and change-specific chaos. I'll, talk in the, I'll go through how to run a chaos day in the rest of this talk, but has anyone been on an AWS game day here? No, perhaps they don't do them in South Africa. Oh, well, somebody has. Great, excellent. Okay, so AWS game days are a really fun thing to do, and they're run in local AWS centers, and they provide you a, a pretend production system. Uh, and one I went on recently it was a system that allows you to rent a unicorn, uh, which is very useful. Uh, so you're there working as an as operability engineer, trying to keep this uh, unicorn rental service going. And you get points depending on how many requests per second it's serving and what kind of response times are. You're shown how to operate it. You're given a basic architecture diagram, some, some basic run books. And then over the course of the day, they start making changes to it. They start increasing the load on it. and start causing failures to happen. And it's a really great way of learning how to observe things, how to tweak things, and how to design systems that are more resilient. Change-specific chaos is where an engineering team looks at a feature that they're working on and starts trying to do um, failure-based testing just around that specific feature. So way before they get it released into production, they run some basic tests to see how does our, our system behave when we're introducing this feature and parts within it fail or things that this feature depends on fail. It's a very, very simple way of starting to introduce chaos engineering into your uh, engineering process. Automa automated chaos is probably one of the ones most people have heard of, uh, made famous by a chaos monkey from Netflix. Another simple way of doing automated chaos, which saves you a lot of money if you're on AWS or GCP, is just to switch to things like spot instances or preemptible VMs. So compute instances, if you're not familiar with these, um, where you can't predict the kind of lifetime of these instances. So you are going to have services running on these instances. And at any point, those instances could be terminated. That means that you're, you start thinking about, how is my service going to kind of respond? How is my arch architecture going to respond when suddenly an instance dies without any um, or much advance notice? You can also have more fun uh, through automating your, your chaos by uh, hooking it up to um, Super Mario Bro, which is what we did uh, for a recent hackathon. Um, we took a, a Nintendo emulator and configured uh, the game so that each time Mario died, a random Kubernetes pod was destroyed.
In process chaos engineering is um, the, kind of the state that we probably should all try and evolve to as we get more familiar with different, different chaos engineering techniques. So it's where throughout the whole engineering process, right from when the product owner is coming up with a, a new requirement, a new feature that they want the team to add, the whole team are thinking about failure and what the impact is of this change going to be on production and how they can engineer this, this, this change, this feature, to make the system more robust. So it include things like the product owner thinking about what the availability requirements of this feature is. Does the, 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 the kind of service that they're providing need to be available for five nines, or is three nines okay? What should the user experience be of, of um, the, the, the feature if there is a failure? It allows developers then to start thinking about how they can uh, put code changes into their component uh, to make uh, it more resilient to, to, um, to failure. The things like retry mechanisms. It means testers think more about uh, exploratory testing and also exploring how this uh, change is impacted when downstream components fail. And also how if, if, if this change is, has an internal failure itself, how does that impact other parts of the system? And hopefully it means that DevOps engineers have to deal with less shit that gets thrown at them from the rest of the team. So the fourth type of chaos engineering that we tend not to talk about is unplanned chaos. John Orspor recently tweeted that um, production incidents are just unplanned investments. I'm sure not many people here have regular production incidents in their systems, but if you, you know, are one of those rare teams that do have production incidents, then you can learn a lot from them and, and help improve the system's robustness by treating them as an opportunity to learn more about your system. As well as rushing to respond, diagnose, and then fix the production incident, if you try and step back a bit and look at the actual process and mechanics you're working through uh, to, to triage the incident and res resolve it, and try and work out you know, what are we learning as we're looking at this incident? How can we improve the kind of processes and the technology that we've got to make it easier for us to diagnose this instance. So this approach effectively gives you chaos engineering for free and in the most realistic environment because it's in production, everything about it is production-like. So it's a really good place to start uh, unless, you're not, unless you have a perfect system, of course. A note of caution, though, there are some great tools that exist uh, to help with uh, tracking production instance and collecting information together. Um, I think Netflix recently open sourced a really cool tool that they've got for, for bringing lots of information together and helping build a timeline. Those tools are really useful, but if, if you're wanting to improve how you deal with production incidents, I'd encourage you to start simple. Read things like Etsy's debriefing guide or look at Google's um, SRE runbook. Chaos engineering is not just about making our components uh, more resilient or fault tolerant. It starts with people. It's helping everyone involved in delivering a product understand more about how our systems work, how our systems cope with different failures. It's about helping our teams get better at diagnosing failures and then working together to come up with a fix. It also means trying to understand what processes can we improve that allow us to deal with incidents better and get to a quicker a resolution more quickly. Finally, it then comes on to how can we improve the product? How can we make our, our architecture simpler to reason about? When your production stack is on fire, if you've got a really, really complicated architecture, it just makes things 10 times worse. The simpler you can make your architecture, uh, the easier it is then for, for engineers to diagnose and, and come up with a fix for. We'll now look at actually running a chaos day. So uh, we'll talk about um, some context of the organization that have done a few of these in. Uh, and also when, when you know you're ready for it and how you go through it. This is a, a quite large public sector organization. Uh, we had been involved with them as a consultancy for about five years. When we started, uh, it was just one team uh, that we uh, put in working with them. And we, we evolved a, a microservice platform uh, that has grown to have 60 delivery teams working in about six different locations around the UK. It's a very, very high traffic uh, public sector um, system. So there's over 100 million customers that regularly transact with the UK government through this system. On its peak day, it has about 100 million requests going through the system. 
That generates a mass amount of log data and metrics. Now, because it's such a large system, because we have so many teams building, uh, or build, building services on it, we have six platform teams that are dedicated to providing the, the kind of core platform tooling to help those 60 delivery teams be effective. So things like uh, build and deployment systems, things like telemetry, auditing. We have dedicated teams looking after each of those capabilities. And their goal is to make it as easy as possible for the delivery teams to do their work. We started the, the, uh, the, this platform back in 2013, and we um, quickly settled on using whatever cloud we could. And at the time, AWS wasn't available, so we had to choose a, um, another cloud provider in the UK. We went with Docker, because uh, it was cool, Scala, because not many people knew it, and Mongo, because, um, well, it was easy at the time. And we used Elk for our, um, our telemetry stack. The, the platform proved very successful, so we had lots and lots of delivery teams being added to it all around the country, which meant that we were, had to be focused on how to make these teams effective. We didn't have time to, to look into how can we make the, um, you know, the actual systems that we're working on as resilient as possible. We were trying to get speed of delivery, which meant that we did have quite a few production incidents at the same time. The cloud provider that we were using at the time wasn't uh, kind of the best, it wasn't very rock solid, so we added a second and made our architecture multi-active across the two. That was a significant uh, kind of platform change, so it, again, took a lot of our focus. Uh, combining that with lots of production incidents that are going on, we've got lots of free chaos engineering happening uh, the whole time, so we're learning lots in, in that way. Finally, a couple of things happened around 2017. Um, so the first significant uh, improvement that happened was that you convinced the organization, uh, their, their kind of governance boards, to allow the delivery teams to deploy to production at any time they wanted, instead of having to go through a governance process that involved them creating a ticket with our, our build and deployment team. And that team would have to then plug a USB stick into one computer, put the deployment slug on it, walk across the room, there's an air gap between the uh, non-production and production, put into a production machine and, and set off the deployment process. So that freed up a massive amount of capacity for our platform engineers. We also, thank goodness, moved on to AWS because they opened a data center in the UK. Moving to AWS was probably the, the kind of most significant thing we did in terms of improving our platform's performance and resilience. Uh, it, was, um, it provided us a very, very rock solid platform that we could then look at how we improve our own components on top of. So at the beginning of 2018, we realized that we, because we had more capacity in our platform teams and because we knew that the underlying platform uh, that were on AWS was pretty rock solid and we were using things like auto scaling groups to, and we had auto healing in, in place uh, for our docking containers. We knew that we had a fairly resilient platform, but we weren't sure exactly how resilient. So we thought, let's run a chaos day and really test out what we can do with it. How do you decide then who to involve in a chaos day? How do you decide where to run it? And what are the actual steps for going through the execution? You form a virtual closed team. To keep the degree of, of um, uh, kind of realism, you want the chaos to be uh, happening in surprise, or a surprise to those that are, that are kind of re responding to it. You also want to uh, involve people that are experts from each of these different teams. If there's a production this instant, there's generally one or two people maybe on your team that you always go to to ask for help. Those are the people that you put into the chaos team. And that's for two reasons. Firstly, they know the system the best. They know kind of where the kind of weak points are, where the things that not very many people understand. What are the th parts of the system that only really they understand? And if it were to fail, the team would be stuck. It's also beneficial because it then helps the rest of the team to realize what they don't know. You know what gaps of knowledge are they? What, what kind of questions do they normally ask this person when, when things are on fire? So you form a, a, a team, the Agents of Chaos, and then you help them come through, go through the process of designing uh, some chaos experiments. They need some constraints, though. To start off with, you get them to draw out a rough system architecture and think about what the normal steady state operation is. 
So if your, your, your system is, is dealing with its busiest uh, kind of peak day, how does it normally perform? What are the characteristics of your different components that tell you things are okay? And it's important to understand this, uh, both from a kind of a technical perspective in terms of, say, the four golden signals, but also from a business perspective. Because you want to know, if I start failing things, if, if I'm starting to deliberately invoke failures in an experiment, what am I expecting to see happen? How are teams going to kind of become aware of these failures? And what impact on the business are we simulating here? And you need to be able to answer those questions in order to prioritize the different experiments that you're going to run. It's also important to understand what parts of your, your system do you actually have control over and they are beneficial to try and invoke failures on. So for instance, we were on AWS, um, and at the time they had two availability zones uh, in the UK. There was no point in us simulating all their availability zones dying because our system would be down, completely down, there'd be nothing we could do about it. But there was benefit to us uh, simulating one availability zone going down. You also need to decide which parts of your system are untouchable. So if you're gonna be running this in production or a pre-production environment, there might be some critical release or critical work that is happening at the same time as your chaos day uh, that would be severely impacted if you were to start breaking things in that area. So it's important to come up with these kind of constraints uh, for the agents of chaos. You then put them in a room, give them lots of food and drink, and ask them to come up with some great ideas for how to, um, how to break things and focusing on you know, what are we wanting to learn? What kind of things can we break in a way that we can't quite, can't quite predict the outcome of? It's helpful to give them a, kind of a, a bit more of a, a kind of template. So they do lots of brand, brainstorming, come up with lots of different post-it notes. And then we form them into a slightly kind of, uh, kind of clearer definitions of each experiment. So what, can, compo which, what component are we going to fail in this uh, experiment? What's the failure that we're either going to realistically um, kind of invoke or we're going to simulate somehow? And then what result are you in expecting? So for instance, if you're going to um, cause network traffic to start slowing down by maybe um, simulating that by changing how a proxy is behaving and in, in reducing the timeout on the proxy, are you expecting teams to, to receive alerts for that? Are you expecting uh, retry mechanisms to kick in? Or are you worried that no one's going to notice apart from your customers? For each experiment, it's then really critical that you understand how you're going to roll back the experiment. Because it's quite possible that you may break the system and no one can fix it. And you don't want to leave your production system completely broken or even your pre-production system completely broken. We learned that on the first chaos day that um, we went quite, quite mad for a day, broke lots and lots of things, and it took us about three or four days to uh, return our staging environment back to normal. And we weren't very popular with 60 teams relying on it. Chaos days are a perfect opportunity as well to start exploring some what's kind of security um, kind of holes you've got in your, your system. So if, you, if you've got any security engineers or, or um, people that are really interested in trying to hack your system, get them involved in the chaos day as well. When people are really busy running around putting out fires, they tend not to notice security incidents. So it's a really good opportunity to, to have some experiments where you're, you're kind of testing out um, if someone were to, to create a fake uh, identity that has access to parts of the production system, would people notice? Would people notice if malicious code was put in? Would people notice if someone started you know, shutting down services? Uh, let's imagine they were a developer that got a bit hacked off uh, with all these problems that were happening. Having come up with a list of experiments, you then need to decide where we're going to run them. Netflix are quite famous because they, they run their experiments in production. You don't have to do that to get the benefit from a chaos day. You do have to think about um, what environment is closest to production in terms of the load that we can simulate on it, the telemetry that we have that allows us to see uh, how those failures manifest themselves, things like the alerting. Do we have alerts set up or can we configure our alerts in, in a pre-production environment to respond in a similar way to what they do on production? And then you need to decide 
how far out are we going to go uh, with our chaos? Are we going to limit it to just some components that will have minimal impact on other teams? Or are we going to try and take down the whole platform? I was doing some maths earlier um, to try and work out, you know, given the size of the platform, if we've got 60 delivery teams, uh, how much it would cost if those delivery teams stopped work for a day. And it's about 12 million rand. When we did our first chaos day, we had to be very careful because if you uh, cost the UK government 12 million rand, you're not going to be very popular unless you can convince that the benefit of running the chaos day is way more than that, which I don't think it was. So we deliberately um, just involved the platform teams and we tried to simulate failures and run failures that we were fairly confident weren't, wouldn't have any impact on the delivery teams uh, using our platform. So we're just trying to focus on um, running small experiments that would help us learn about the platform tooling that we'd provided. You also need to establish kind of quite widely how are we going to communicate around different uh, problems that we see uh, when we're running the chaos day. It's a good idea to try and pick a, a similar communication channel to what you normally use for production instance. So if you have a public Slack channel, for instance, uh, that you use uh, when there's a production instance, then make sure you're using a similar type channel when you're running your chaos day. Let's move on then to the actual mechanics of the chaos day itself. In our experience, there is benefit in warning uh, everyone that's on the platform about the chaos day. Uh, there's two reasons for that. So firstly, people need to know that if something is, is, is happening in a pre-production environment, then they should be treating it just like it was a production problem. You don't want them to think, well, it's just QA, we can sort out another time. You want them to be treating it as though production is on fire. You also want them to be working just like they're working on any other normal day. Because you don't know when uh, production incidents happen, do you? And it's the same with the, with the chaos day. You want people working as normal, not waiting around, watching all of their uh, Kibana uh, dashboards, uh, trying to detect when the first failure happens. It's also useful to communicate a date in case there are any critical production releases that are happening at the same time. It won't be very popular if you take down a pre-production environment just as a critical release is trying to go through it before it gets to production. Finally, it's really important, as we learned on our first chaos day, to agree when you're going to stop, start repairing things and making sure you leave the environment in a good working state. It's a good idea to probably involve, allow for a couple of hours to do this uh, because it get very easily out of control, um, as chaos can. Then on the actual day itself, put the agents of chaos in a room, give them lots of food and drink, and help them uh, to, to kind of keep at pace running through these experiments. It's useful for having someone to facilitate what they're doing, uh, just so that they don't get too carried away and, and break everything, but also so they can time box the different experiments, so they can run an experiment long enough to get learning from it, but not so long that, uh, that you just have one experiment running for the whole day, or you have one experiment that then masks the learning from other ones. The team also need help uh, self-documenting what they're doing. And Slack channels are really great for this. So if, if the team is encouraged to, to put into Slack, even if they're discussing this face-to-face, -face, what experiment are we running? What are we observing in terms of how, how teams are responding, what we're seeing in different dashboards, and then how people are resolving things? If you can get them to document those kind of things in Slack. It makes the review process very easy because you then have, effectively have a, a, a timeline that you can put out of Slack to walk through. Now for kind of the purpose of realism, you want this channel, if you're using a Slack channel, to be a private one. You don't want people that are responding to the instance to have any awareness of what experience is being run uh, during the day itself. We found Trello uh, to be really useful for this as well. So we use that uh, template I showed you before. And then we have additional columns, so what experiments are in progress, what experiments have broken the platform, and what experiments did uh, the, the different teams manage to resolve successfully. For everyone else, they should just be treating it like another ordinary day at the office. Uh, they shouldn't be sat there watching for things to break. We okay? <laughs> I should warn you as well, just an apology. Um, so this is a talk on chaos days on unpredictable failures, and I think I have about a 20% technical failure rate doing this talk. So I am quite expecting 
uh, some piece of tech to fail at any moment. Um, we're okay so far, so let's see if we can get to the end. So for everyone else that's responding to the chaos, it's important um, that they also uh, try and document what they're doing. Again, using a Slack channel to communicate and, and collaborate on diagnosing, pro oh, diagnosing problems. <laughs> I'm cursing myself, aren't I? Diagnosing problems um, just to make the review process easier. They need to also treat these things as though production was on fire. There's lots of opportunities to learn throughout the whole um, Chaos Day process. It's not just through the review process at the end. I've observed this multiple times. When you put the agents of Chaos in a room and they start uh, talking through the system architecture and sharing their knowledge about how different components behave, what gaps there are in understanding about um, kind of failure modes, there's a lot of learning that is shared just in, in that planning session. Likewise, on the actual day itself, when um, the, the agents of Chaos are going through actually executing the chaos, causing things to fail. Sometimes they'll try and simulate a fail that won't actually happen as though they, they, they thought it did. And that's a good learning in itself. For the teams that are responding, it's like a fire drill, uh, but perhaps slightly more stressful and a bit more fun. Um, they're stepping through and responding to uh, what they should think is a real production incident and getting the learning of, of you know, how do we diagnose something? What information do we have in the ROM book that tells us how to fix things? To reinforce the learning from the, those different uh, previous sessions, uh, running group retrospectives is then really important. So where you're involving multiple teams in a chaos day, ask each team that responds to different experiments to go away and run their own post-mortem. That post-mortem should focus primarily on what have they learned about the knowledge that's in people's heads, about how people respond uh, to, to, to problems, how they know what system to look at, how they know which dashboards which dashboards to use. Then try and understand more about the processes that people use to, to, to collaborate on incidents. How do they uh, fix something? What's the process for getting a change tested and deployed into the environment? And then finally, move your focus to the actual um, the kind of technical side. So what things have we learned about our components uh, that have been affected by these different experiments? It's really important not to come up with a massive list of, of you know, things I need to do to fix my, my production stack. You don't win any prizes for having the longest number of to-dos uh, following a chaos day. The focus has got to be on learning. What can we learn about our system, about the way people work? Because a lot of the things you're learning is, is information that's hidden. It's in people's heads. It's implicit in the way they work. The second aspect to, to get teams to focus on is the chaos day mechanics. So what can you do to make the chaos day more effective next time? Each team run their own retro and postmortems, then come together and you have a retro of retros to share uh, the highlights from those different learnings um, across all the teams. From running about four or five different chaos days, we've learned that when you start off, you start really, really small. Uh, we recently ran this with a, a private sector e-commerce organization and we just had two teams out of the 15 or so involved. And we only ran about eight experiments on the day. And that itself still caused a lot of pain uh, for people. Chaos days uh, can be quite stressful. So for the first one, it's important, because you're going through a learning process, uh, to try and uh, kind of limit how many things you break and the degree to which you break things. Focus on. What changes can we make? What, what um, failures can we simulate that are going to help us to learn in a way that's not going to stress people out completely and make them quit? We've also learned that it's very hard to do this on production. Uh, in all the places that run chaos days, we've always done it in a pre-production environment. We've still learned a lot by doing that. But it, I think it's very hard to, um, to run failures on a production environment that aren't going to be so com customer impacting uh, that could affect your business. It might be possible in your, your context, but it's worth considering. We've also learned that pre-production environments are different to production. No matter how hard you try to make all your production cookie cutter or your environments cookie cutter environments, there's still subtle differences. Things like uh, alert thresholds can be different from in pre-production to production. Finally, we learned that, that chaos days are a lot of fun, uh, both for the people coming with the evil schemes for how to break things. And that the teams that are kind of working together hard to respond and learn more about the system. 
I hope you found this useful and it's given you some ideas about uh, how you can prove you know, the things you, learn, you understand about your system's resilience and robustness. I'd encourage you to go away from here and think about your own system. Think about you know, what knowledge exists in people's heads about your, your architecture, about how robust it is, how it responds to different failures. Think about where you are in the journey of, of chaos engineering. Do you have regular production incidents? If you do, then maybe that, that's a great learning opportunity. How can you improve the way you manage those production incidents to learn more about your system? So to consider what kind of next step you could take. If you'd like some help running a chaos day, it's something that uh, equal experts are very happy to, to talk to you about. Uh, we've also recently published um, a playbook on running a chaos day that uh, we're doing it iteratively, so so far it's got a five minute version uh, that takes you through the basic steps of running a chaos day. And that's it. So thank you very much for listening. If you've got any questions, then I think we've got some time. Awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> any questions? It was a hand. It's a photo. We have, and he's taking oh. a selfie. It's from the back. <laughs> Sorry, you mentioned... Um, one of the things is maybe alerts are different in, in, in a pre-production environment to production environment. Um, but what about the case where your, your pre-production environment doesn't actually have any traffic? I mean, I don't know anybody who has alerts on their pre-production environment. Okay, great. So your, your question is, uh, what if your pre-production environment doesn't have any traffic and you're surprised that you have alerts in a pre-production environment? Um, the, the public sector platform that I was describing, um, part of helping the delivery teams uh, build more resilient services was that uh, they, they write their own alerts and they test those alerts out in pre-production environments. Um, we also had uh, load tests configured, so each delivery team had load tests for their service that they would run in a pre-production environment. And that allowed us to very easily, for the chaos day, uh, run lots of load tests whilst we were doing these experiments. Uh, we then had to uh, reconfigure the alert thresholds again in pre-production pre um, so that they would fire. If you're in a situation where you don't have traffic going through your pre-production environment, then it's a good idea to generate some. Um, you know, just to the simple case of having a very easy way of, of regularly exercising the services and understanding how, you know, how they operate. Um, production is you know, where you want alerting, but you need a way of testing out your alerting and trying to refine it and improve it. So again, I'd encourage people to look at putting alerting into a pre-production environment, just even if it's something that's configured uh, to be off by default, but it, as long as you can configure it to, you know, be on at certain thresholds, then that could be really useful for, for delivery teams to get kind of greater ownership of those services. Does that answer your question? It, um you mentioned pulling your, some of your top domain experts from various teams into your engines of chaos virtual team. But those are typically also the people that a team's going to run to when something goes wrong that's weird. Who they're going to say, how do I fix this? Because they're the experts. So yep. if you've pulled those people out of the response team during your chaos day, doesn't that change, mean that your chaos day results is not going to reflect what your actual resilience is? It, it, it does. Essentially in a good way. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good question. So you're asking uh, whether um, by pulling out the most experienced people from, from each team, um, that's going to change uh, how a team would respond and the kind of how they respond to problems. You know, so there's two things. The agents of chaos, they are, they're not locked in a room, but they are uncontactable during a chaos day. They are like they have been hit by a bus. Um, we did have one, one particular case where uh, a team was really, really stuck. They simply couldn't fix the problem that, that had been in, um, kind of caused, and they did have to grab the person out of the room. But as a rule, we don't let that happen. Um, and that is kind of really important learning for the team because yeah, it's, a, it's a very effective way of highlighting to the team what they don't know. You don't want single points of failure, single points of knowledge in a team, particularly you know, if that point of knowledge is how to resolve a production incident. Cool. Hi, thank, 
Hi, thank you. Um, great talk. Um, I was wondering, have you found an effective way to run a chaos day against your monitoring and alerting system? Yeah, yes. Yeah, good question. So have we run, found an effective way to run a chaos day against our monitoring alerting system? Um, yeah, we, we have um, mostly cookie cutter environments, so we have the same um, telemetry stack in each of our environments, just kind of scaled slightly differently. Um, so with uh, the chaos days we ran, we would always target our telemetry stack um, as part of the, the chaos day. We learned after the first chaos day that there's little value in, in causing your telemetry stack to fall over whilst you're running other experiments, because teams are blind. Um, to what's going on. They, they simply can't see all these other experiments impact that, that's going on. And um, so we'd, each chaos day we would think about um, either, you know, what failure in our telemetry stack um, does the team kind of least know about how to respond to? What, what failure do they want to res kind of practice responding to? So with the amount of logs uh, that um, I was showing on one of the kind of earlier slides, uh, our sc stack had to be really, really scalable. Uh, yeah, that one. Um, and we, we often had problems in uh, pre-production as well as production uh, where the, the amount of log data was causing um, kind of Elasticsearch issues because uh, we were running this in AWS using our own kind of hosted um, ELK instances. So it, it was a really useful way of like, you know, okay, let's fill up one of the, the disks or let's fail one of the um, kind of Elasticsearch instances. Um, let's delete all the dashboards um, we, we had our dashboards under source control. We had an automated process uh, for redeploying the dashboards from source control. But it was the, the onus was on the delivery teams. If they created a dashboard, they had to then put it into source control. And this is a good way of, of helping teams realize they hadn't done that. Great. Okay. One more question, then we'll... Um, you used the word telemetry. I'm interested to know what that includes. In your stack? Yeah, sure. So telemetry included um, how we collect and view our logs, which is um, Kibana and things below that. How we collect and view our metrics. Um, we originally used, or we eventually uh, used um, ClickHouse uh, connected to Grafana, and then it includes our alerting, uh, which we had um, Sensu and Pager Duty. Um, yeah, those were primarily it. Does that answer your question? Cool. Thank you very much. Sorry, there's oh. one, one thing I forgot to say. Um, um, when you're thinking about what things to fail, uh, don't assume that everything in AWS is just going to work. Um, so one of the lessons we learned in production was that um, some AWS components can behave in unpredictable ways. So don't, does anyone here use Aurora? OK, yeah, if you, so Aurora is you know, really, really resilient. It's a fantastic uh, database service. And, and we were using it for our uh, our API platform to store the configuration data about our APIs. Um, we had it uh, distributed across two availability zones. Um, what could go wrong? Well, AWS added a third availability zone in the UK, uh, which was really good and made things more resilient, except we had configured Aurora to automatically distribute itself across all availability zones. So suddenly in production, up popped this third availability zone Aurora saw it and said, oh, that should be my master. Oh, there's nothing there. I'm going to delete everything. <laughs> but, you know, that happens. You have backups, right? Backups that you've tested the restore from. Uh, so, so we had to actually recreate our production database from our staging one. That's, that's a true story. <laughs> <laughs> on, on that bombshell. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.